It's my pleasure today to introduce Jerry Kaplan, who has traveled here from California to share his thoughts with us about the future of artificial intelligence. Dr. Kaplan teaches about the social and economic impact of AI at Stanford University. He has written three award-winning books, all of which are available in Italian translation. He is mainly known as a technology entrepreneur, having founded four Silicon Valley startups. He is co-inventor of many technologies that you likely use today, including the tablet computer, internet auctions, and digital musical instruments. Please join me in welcoming Jerry to our main stage today. Hello, Sophia. <laughs> oh, hello. Biangiorno Romini. Biangiorno Romini. Since that's the only words I know in Italian, I hope you will permit me to speak in English. Now, I have an admission to make. Between the time I was invited to give this talk and today, something amazing happened. The field of artificial intelligence changed. Not by a little, but by a lot. For decades, there's been slow and steady progress in AI. First with programs that played games at an expert level, like chess and Go, then with programs that could describe the contents of pictures or transcribe spoken language and perform tasks like driving cars, at least on the uh, gentle American highways, perhaps not on the busy streets of Rome. I don't think that will ever happen. Uh, hard problems like identifying faces and translating between languages became a reality, and those are now in daily use. Now, while this is great progress, each of these applications required its own specialized program tuned for a specific task. A program that could read an x-ray was of no use reviewing a loan application. A program to estimate crop yields could not also plan your drive from uh, Ramini to uh, Barcelona. People working in AI have always hoped that someday this would change. They hoped that someday we could develop a single integrated technology capable of doing all those tasks at once. The name for this dream was artificial general intelligence. Now, until recently, most experts, including me, thought this was little more than a fantasy that would be far off in the future, decades away at best, if ever. I truly never expected to see it in my lifetime. So here is my confession. I was wrong. We all were. Some astonishing recent technical advances have made this dream a reality. And yes, that's, uh, the Pope gives me confession, personally. The breakthrough is called generative artificial intelligence, but that doesn't begin to describe what these systems are or what they're going to mean for the way we live and the way we work. Generative AI is going to change everything. We make future? No kidding. This time for real. Early examples of this new technology are freely available on the internet where you can chat with a type of generative AI system called a large language model about any, any subject at all. I encourage you to try it for yourself. But be prepared to be shocked. Ask a large language model to compose a poem about your favorite city, which I did. Give you advice on how to get a job. Tell you how to fix a broken window or write a report on any topic of interest to you you will find the breadth and depth of its knowledge and its ability to engage with you in a natural way utterly amazing. 
you might wonder if aliens have landed and uh, are playing some kind of trick on us by pretending to be a computer program. My wife and I used it to plan our trip to Italy. And I used it to help me write this talk. Now, since I only have a few minutes of your time, I'm not going to give you a live demonstration. Instead, I will use my remaining time to tell you the four critical things you need to know to prepare for what is coming. First of all, you may be tempted to think these systems will be like what you see in the movies. AI is often portrayed as super intelligent robots, powerful and evil. Sophia is not, I promise you. Ruthlessly focused on enslaving and destroying humanity. Oh my God, what are we going to do when they come for us? What I want you to understand is that this is nonsense. There is no they. Despite appearances, generative AI systems don't think in the human sense, and they don't have minds. Unfortunately, the companies that are producing the current crop of these systems have dressed their systems up with human-like behavior to make it more convenient to use them. For instance, they tend to use the word I when they respond to you. And I think this is unfortunate and a bit, and a bit misleading. What I want you to understand is that most of that is nonsense. There is no they, despite appearances. Generative AI systems don't think in the human sense. Where am I? They don't have minds. Unfortunately, OK. Have you ever gone, had a, a, a nightmare where you stood up to give a talk and your slides were in the wrong place? That's what just happened to me. Can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. <laughs> I will have dreams about this for the next 20 years. The way these systems work is surprisingly simple. Large language models are learning programs that take as input extremely large collections of text and then boil that information down into a compact form called a neural network. The currently available large language models are trained on pretty much the entire contents of the internet. So they have access to a staggeringly large amount of information. And then, when you type something in, they're designed to predict the next word, what the most likely next word is going to be, if, you typed, uh, if what you typed in appeared in their database. They're extremely sophisticated statistical word prediction uh, engines. Uh, large language models predict words in an incomprehensibly vast and intricate web of interconnected content. But why this simple technique produces such apparently intelligent behavior, as you'll see with Sophia, is something of a mystery, even to the experts. But the fact is that all these programs, that's what they do. They don't have emotions, desires, and goals of their own. They aren't going to rise up and challenge humankind. I hope you agree, Sophia. <laughs> they aren't going to drink up all the fine wine in Italy and buy up all the prime beachfront property here in Ramini. The second thing you should know is that there's already good evidence that this is going to change the way we work. We believe it or not, programmers are already substantially increasing their productivity because these systems are really good at helping them to write computer programs. Writers are using it to create first drafts of articles, which I've done, brochures and documents, and specialized versions of the technology can create beautiful images that today require the time and effort of skilled uh, graphic artists. And this is going to shake up our labor markets by making people more efficient, but it will also reduce costs. And it's going to build new markets, and it's going to create new jobs for people who are skilled at using the new technology. The best way to understand this is that generative AI is an advance in automation. 
and it will have the same effect as previous waves of automation. We're about to experience a new industrial revolution. But this time, instead of augmenting our muscles, it's going to augment our minds. The third thing to understand is that large language models are also going to create new problems or make some problems that we already have that much worse. You know, dictators and criminals can use this technology to flood our public forums with propaganda, to fool people into thinking they are talking to a real person, to lie and to cheat and to steal on an industrial scale. And unregulated, it will also tend to increase inequality, making the rich richer and the poor poorer. We will need new laws to control how these systems can be used, by whom, and for what purposes. Now, this will be challenging, but it will not be impossible. The fourth and final thing I want you to know is that the cur current group of uh, large language models are only the tip of the iceberg. In the next few years, you're going to see specialized applications that run on top of today's large language models. And they will be able to provide medical services, for example, uh, at very low cost and to do so worldwide. They can provide convenient access to government services. They can teach our children. They can manage our public infrastructure and generally to improve our lives. You're likely to have your own personal assistant, won't that be nice, that lives in your phone, who's going to represent your interests and handle all sorts of tasks that currently require your time and attention. But to do all this, to do all this, we must be thoughtful about how we put this technology to use. It isn't good or bad by itself, but it can be used by good or bad people for good or bad purposes. How well we manage this tremendous gift will be the defining challenge of our times. Whether the future is going to be a dystopian as portrayed, uh, as portrayed in the uh, Terminator, or the paradise as portrayed in Star Trek is going to be up to you. So, my fondest hope is that you will use this new technology and this new power wisely. Thank you very much.